Hi, I'm here with Dr. William Lane Craig and Dr. Craig, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you, David. A lot of people have been hearing about Molinism and I'm not sure what position to take on it yet, but a lot of people are hearing the term and don't know what it is. I was wondering if you could just tell us uh, sort of in a nutshell what Molinism is. Molinism is a way of reconciling divine sovereignty and human freedom. It's named after Luis Molina, who was a 16th century Jesuit theologian. And what Molina said is that logically prior to God's creating the world, God knew what any free creature that he might create would freely do in any set of circumstances that he might place that person. And so by creating those circumstances and placing the people in them, God is able to providentially order the world so that his purposes are ultimately achieved through the free decisions of creatures. So it gives God tremendous sovereignty over human history, but without annihilating human freedom. Now, so there seem to be two basic ideas. One, that God has a certain kind of knowledge, and two, how he puts that knowledge to use. Yes. I can't see why anyone would really object to the idea of God having middle knowledge. So do, do people object more to the, to the part about how God uses it? No, actually they don't. I, I think that once you grant that God has middle knowledge, and that is to say, knowledge of how persons would freely choose in any circumstance God might put them in, then it's very difficult to deny that God could use such knowledge in providentially ordering the world. So those who are critical of Molinism typically will deny that God has this kind of knowledge. And in order to do that and yet preserve divine omniscience, you have to say that these sorts of subjunctive conditionals, as they're called, aren't not true or false, that they have no truth value, that there is no truth value that if I were rich, I would buy a Mercedes, for example. You have to say that these propositions have no truth value. And I think that's a very problematic view. Um, we sometimes base our very lives upon these kinds of subjunctive conditionals. And moreover, these kinds of subjunctive conditionals are found in Scripture. So, when Saul going up to, to Keilah. Yes, well, or I'm thinking, for example, of I think 2 Corinthians 2.8, I may have the reference wrong, where Paul says that none of the rulers of this world understood this, that is Christ's crucifixion, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now that is a subjunctive conditional. If they had understood this, they would not have crucified Jesus. So unless you're willing to say that this is a truth value gap in scripture, here is a verse that is not true. It seems to me that any biblically faithful Christian is committed to the fact that these kinds of subjunctive conditionals have truth value and are often true. Now, what, one of the things I'm wondering is, there, there are different ways you can sort of uh, propose a view like this. One is to sort of put it forward as a kind of model and to see yeah. how, how it works out. And, and two is to say that this is the correct view. Which, which are, are you maintaining or something in between? Well, I tend toward the more modest view to say that this is a way of reconciling the twin streams of biblical tradition of affirming on the one hand divine sovereignty and on the other hand, significant human freedom. This is a proposal for putting those together, which allows us to affirm sovereignty without annihilating freedom. And so I find it to be a very helpful model for scriptural interpretation because it enables you to affirm both of these traditions of scripture in a way that I think no other model enables you to do. Now, uh, one last thing. Uh, whenever the topic comes up, there always seems to be someone who says, well, this is just Roman Catholicism, and you're getting this. It's, it's a recent development, so uh, how would you respond? I would say what I just said, that this is a model for understanding these twin traditions of Scripture, and regardless of who proposed it, that yes, it was a Jesuit, there's nothing about the model that is Catholic. It, it, is a, a, I think, brilliant way of affirming and reconciling these seemingly um, inconsistent 
twin traditions of scripture of divine sovereignty and human freedom. And in fact, this has been widely adopted by Protestants as well. Jacob Arminius uh, was the conduit through which Molinism entered into Protestant theology and became widespread. So I think it's a view that is of intersectarian uh, value and uh, has opponent, uh, and has proponents on both sides. Now, just, just last thing, how w would people learn more about you and your ministry? Go to our website, reasonablefaith.org, where you can download tons of free materials. Everything on the site is available free, and there's a, a lot of material there for folks, reasonablefaith.org. All right, be sure to visit the site. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Thank you, David.